Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody this morning. Let's begin our worship today by singing, O Church Arise, number 661. O Church Arise, let's stand together as we sing. strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the The Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, then Christ emerges from the grave. This victory march continues till the day. Every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, put strength in every stride. Give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumph. His grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. Please remain standing for opening prayer. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning, Lord, to worship you, Lord, and to praise you and just to lift your name up. And Lord, on this day that we remember our mothers, Lord. We would just ask your blessing on all the mother, mothers here today. Um, we acknowledge the sacrifice and the strength and what they do, Lord, and that you have orchestrated it in this way, Lord. You have seen fit that the population continues because of mothers, Lord, and the love and care that they show. And so we just ask a special blessing on each of them today, Lord. We especially think of those who have just recently become mothers and those, Lord, who are going to be mothers very soon, Lord. We just ask that your care and your love and your just your grace and mercy would be with them and each and every mother here. And Lord, we just pray for Enrique as he brings the word to us this morning that you would just just um, strengthen him, Lord, and that uh, the Spirit would work through him, Lord, and that we as a congregation would be open to your word, that we would be hearers and doers, Lord, that we would take what we hear here today and live it out by the power of the Spirit. And Lord, we pray for the pastor, Lord, as he's away in Hong Kong, and we know he is having a good time there, Lord, that I'm sure he is excited about what he is doing and Lord serving you in this way and did we just ask special blessings and safety on his behalf and Lord continue to be with Elizabeth and the children Lord and just bless them and we just thank you for all you do again in Jesus precious name and for his sake amen you may be seated <coughs> And 
we are in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. We start reading in 33. Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's continue worshiping now with number 290 in our songbooks, our song of the month, The Power of the Cross. Let's stand together as we sing. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us. sing number 313, 313 near the cross.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's great. Everybody's happy this morning to see some sunshine finally, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, we can praise the Lord for the cross. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, welcome everyone and uh, like to uh, wish all you mothers out there a happy Mother's Day. Uh, you certainly are a blessing to the church and to your families, and uh, I am grateful for the privilege to uh, be able to uh, lift you all up to the Lord this morning, and uh, pray that you do have a, a wonderful day today, and uh, hopefully you're going to be pampered a little. Of course, Elizabeth, you're going to have to wait. Huh? <laughs> well, maybe Jim will pitch in and help you a little. <laughs> while Pastor Jim's away. <laughs> I'm sure he would be missing uh, not being here with you. But anyway, uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, I'd like to remind you that uh, there is a green slip in your bulletin this morning, and uh, you might want to take a look at that and read through it. It's going to be a family conference. It's going to be held in the uh, Greater Baltimore Washington Fellowship uh, presents this, and it's going to be held at, um, I forgot the name of that church, but it's on there, Faith Bible, Faith Bible Church. <laughs> okay, but uh, consider that, and uh, we might want to uh, get signed up for that. I don't know if we had, did we have a sign-up sheet for it? You need to sign up for the headcount for lunch. Okay, so you need to make sure you sign up if you're planning on going so that they can have enough food to uh, feed everyone. So keep that in mind. Tuesday evening, we do have mops, and uh, we would encourage you to be out for that. And uh, also, uh, Wednesday evening, this Wednesday coming, is the men's and women's Bible study. If you have not been to that yet, I would encourage you to come. Uh, it is a wonderful time of being able to uh, learn some personal things about God and, and our relationship to Him. And there are a lot of helpful things there, and, and in particularly with the men, we've had a great time of being able to share uh, some of the things uh, in our own lives and how God is working that out. So uh, I would encourage you to be there. Uh, we will be in the men's group. We will be in chapter 6 of session 3. So if you have the book, I would encourage you to read through that and uh, be prepared. And the ladies are finishing up, I think, their last week of their book uh, that they're doing uh, in the vine. So... Um, if I could have the gentleman come forward for the offering, and uh, we will go to the Lord in prayer. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you so much for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. And Lord, it's wonderful to see the sun shining again. And Father, we are grateful and thankful for the rain too. And Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us and how you bless us how you protect us, Lord, and how you provide for everything in our lives. And, Lord, we are grateful for that this morning. And we come, Lord, just to give thanks to you and praise to your name. And, Father, we lift up to you those who are struggling through issues uh, this week, Lord. May it be health problems and, uh, Lord, just uh, struggles of work. And we pray that this morning, Father, that we would be able to cast them all aside and, Father, that we would concentrate upon your word this morning and what you have for us, that we could feed upon that, Lord, and be fed and get the nutrients out of that, as Pastor Jim mentioned. And, Father, that we would apply that to our lives this week. So we are looking forward to what you will do in our midst this morning. I pray that, Lord, you would bind away all distractions and that... Uh, your spirit would work in our hearts and our minds to focus upon you. And Father, we are grateful this morning for the privilege to be able to lift up and honor uh, the mothers that you have brought forth to us, Lord. And we're grateful for that and ask your special blessing on them today. And uh, Father, I pray that um, in all things uh, you would be honored through that. And Father, we thank you for the privilege to be able to uh, offer our uh, offerings to you this morning, Lord, that we could give back a portion of how you have blessed us. And I pray that we would do this with a cheerful heart. And I pray, Lord, that uh, in all things it would be used to your glory and to further your kingdom. And we ask these things with a grateful and thankful heart in Jesus' name. Amen.
one uh, quick reminder that Kim just mentioned to me is uh, there are no home groups tonight, so we can spend time with our mothers this evening. Uh, for our final song before the message, we'll sing number 442. <laughs> 442, I will follow. Let's stand together as we sing, and children at this time can be dismissed to junior church. seated. And as you take your seats, you can turn to the book of Romans. <clears throat> book of Romans, chapter 12. I have to confess that uh, when Pastor Jim slated me for this day, I did not recognize that it was Mother's Day. <laughs> and so as when my wife told me that four or five days ago, I said, oh, too late. <laughs> so in, in, in a very real way, this is not a Mother's Day message. But as my wife so graciously pointed out to me as well, uh, there are some significant implications that mothers have on our text today. And I think, uh, I think it'll be a powerful illustration for us when we get there. You're there in chapter 12 in Romans. Let's go ahead and read that first verse of Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You ever heard of the term identity crisis? As a kid, as a teenager, I can remember throwing that phrase around with other people, sort of a joking. It's one of those jokes that as a kid you say and you don't even realize why it's funny. And I, and I can remember throwing that term around. And as I studied and meditated on this message, this concept came to my mind. The Oxford Dictionary defines identity, identity crisis like this says, a period of uncertainty and confusion 
in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. A period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. We find our value in how we identify ourselves. Whatever we identify ourselves as is what we will feel is most valuable about ourselves. You know, you, in, a, in a conversation when you maybe first meet somebody, especially between men, I know that one of the first questions that will come up is, what do you do? Meaning, what do you do for a living? What's, what's your occupation? And we do that because we really identify with each other by what we do for a living. And many men find their identity in what they do for a living. But back to this concept, whatever we identify ourselves as, whatever we call ourselves, that is what we view as most valuable about ourselves. Therefore, it is important about then how we identify ourselves, is it not? Because if we incorrectly identify ourselves, we will have ultimately misplaced our value. And then, when we think about this concept about having our value in, an, our, in our identity, what happens when that thing we value most about ourselves is taken away? Then what? You've all probably read about it. You've probably seen it on some TV station, maybe even heard about it on a radio. That, that superstar athlete who for maybe two decades or more just excelled at their particular sport. And then eventually that athlete retires, right? Can't do it anymore. And he has real struggles adapting to that new way of life, not being that superstar athlete. And you can probably think of people who have, were retired and they came out of retirement, right? They, they try, they go back at it again because they just can't figure out how to live apart from being that baseball player, that football player, whatever sport it might be. But really, doing that only delays the inevitable. They eventually have to stop. Their body breaks down. They can't compete at that level anymore. Some, some of these individuals even experience discouragement and, worst case, even depression. What happened to them? What happened to them? Well, that element about themselves that they valued so much and they found great worth in, it's now gone. And there's nothing meaningful to take place that identified themselves. How they identified themselves is over. And they have nothing meaningful to replace it with. With this concept in mind then, with this definition in mind of, of identity crisis, is it possible then for a Christian to have a sort of identity crisis? And if so, what does that look like? Let's put it this way. If we, as believers, have valued something about ourselves that ends up being taken away from us, perhaps our role in this world changes dramatically, perhaps goals that we had now can never be achieved. These types of events and others lead to confusion and instability. Our foundation, even our bedrock, can be shaken. When you think about it, okay, when you think about it, anything that we value about ourselves, anything can be taken from us. 
Anything that we value about ourselves could be stripped from us in a moment. Anything except for one thing. If you are willing to accept it, there is an identity that we have that no matter what, it cannot be taken away from us. Why do I say if you're willing to accept it? Well, I say it that way because when I said that, when I said there is an identity that we have that no matter what, it cannot be taken away from us, it's what is truly valuable, I guarantee you it's not what you're thinking. (laughs) Because right now you're probably thinking, well, my position in Christ can never be taken from me. Which you're right, it's true. I'm adopted into the family of God. That can never be taken from me. I, am, I belong to Christ. And you're right. But may I suggest that that is God's perspective on us, and we embrace that reality. What I'm calling us to do this morning is how do I, we identify ourselves from our perspective? Does that make sense? How are we identifying ourselves and how are we doing it from our perspective? What is our thinking about us? So often what we value about ourselves is what we think about ourselves. Perhaps you are a mother and you feel that 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 is where you are most valuable or a wife. Perhaps as a husband, you feel yourself as most valuable. Perhaps as a co-worker, as a church member, as a brother or sister in Christ. Perhaps you are a business owner. Any, any number of things that we are and the roles that we have, that is where we can often gravitate to in order to find our sense of worth, to find a real sense of value. But as we mentioned already, any of those things can be stripped from us in an instant. And then what? And then what? What are we left with? What is the one thing that cannot be stripped from us? We are asking the question this morning. How do you identify yourself? And are we identifying ourselves properly? Or are we way off? If you are wondering where are we going with this, good. I'm glad that's your question. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's unpack this section of Scripture I believe we will be challenged by his word today. Let's pray. Father, we do need your help this morning. I need your help. I cannot speak apart from you. So, Lord, I pray that you would use me to only speak your words, to convey your truth to your people. Lord, I pray that that this message would impact the people of Bethel as it has impacted me. Help me to be clear. Lord, I pray that you would help us to find our sense of worth in the right place. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text today begins with beseeching or asking. It says that, I beseech you therefore, brethren. There is a call that, that Paul has as the author of Romans. And we must first look at this one aspect. We are are looking at our response to God's glorious and merciful plan. That is the title of this message this morning. And we're looking at how are we supposed to respond. How are we supposed to respond to God's plan and His mercy in our lives? We're looking then... First of all, 
the basis for our response. You see there in our first, in the first section of our verse, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So Paul is calling to us. He's exhorting and he's, he's encouraging us to do something. And it's on the basis of the mercies of God. What does the mercy of God entail in this context? Well, the reality is it encompasses the 11 previous chapters of this book. And obviously we do not have the appropriate amount of time to deal with all of those 11 chapters. But suffice today, today is to say and summarize it this way. As so many of the Pauline epistles, the first half of this book is doctrinal in nature. Verses, uh, chapters 1 through 11 is doctrinal in nature, and it deals with deep, rich theology. It deals with man's sinful state. And it deals with the answer to our sinful state. You may even remember just a couple weeks ago when Bob Metz was speaking, he spoke out of uh, Romans chapter 5, dealing with Christ, dealing with us having peace with God by, because we are justified through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then talking about how that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly is you and me, that's all of us. And we really see then the unfolding of God's plan to save humanity. Romans 3 details in, 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 in graphic nature the state of our souls and how, and how far removed it is from a holy God. But in chapter 3 and 4 and 5, the hope is there. And he gives us this hope that Christ died for the ungodly, that we might be reconciled unto God because Christ has appeased the wrath of God by taking it on himself. And, and as you think of our salvation, one of the things that I always consider in my mind when I think of our salvation and, 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 and a section of Scripture like the first half of Romans is, is, is that I could have never in my wildest dreams come up with a plan like God did. I mean, we sang about it today, about the cross and, and the, the cruel sacrifice that he undertook, the torture that, that goes along with that. And, and he did that. And it was the only way. God's wrath had to be satisfied, and it was satisfied by Christ on the cross. We could not have done that for ourselves. He took our hopeless state and made a way for us to be reconciled to Him. And that's out of His love, and we do not deserve it. And when you think about the, the, um, the glory and the majesty of God's plan to save humanity, you just sort of sit back and go, wow. That's amazing. I could have never thought that up myself. Only from the mind of God could that have taken place? And perhaps that's why. No, not perhaps. That is why, at the end of the doctrinal section of the book of Romans, starting in verse 33, it was part of our scripture reading, we'll, we'll read it again, of, of chapter 11 in Romans. Paul says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments! And his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him. For, and this is the conclusion of the matter. How can this be explained? 
is the question that could sum up those few verses. How can this be explained? Well, it's explained like this, verse 36. For of him and through him and to him, towards him, that is, are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So we see in great detail and in great majesty the glorious plan that God had. And it's based in His compassion. It's based in His mercy towards us. And this is exactly the basis for which Paul says, I am now asking you, by these mercies of God that we've just talked about, I'm asking you to do something. In Paul's flow of thought then, there is a reaction that we are supposed to have to the mercies of God. There is a res- there, it, it, the mercies of God and His plan to save us, it demands a response. <clears throat> Paul is not giving us this doctrinal section, and, nor does he do it in other portions of Scripture, just so we can have this mental assent to, yes, I know this, and I understand it, and yet it never affects our lives practically. That's never the intent of any doctrine. No, the purpose for theology and doctrine is so that it impacts our everyday life. And that's exactly where the author of this book is going to go. Paul moves to a very practical side to discuss how we are supposed to live in light of God's glorious plan and His mercy. So that is the basis for our response. But now we move then to the quality of our response. The basis of our response, it's God's mercy. The quality of our response, well, that is a full commitment to Him. The quality of our response, it begins in our text with a presentation. More specifically, it it begins with the presentation of our bodies. This word, to present, it actually can be found earlier in this same book, in chapter 6. There, the word is translated yield when it says to, uh, when it talks about yielding our members as slaves to righteousness, or we could yield our members um, as slaves to sin. That word there is the same word here is translated present. So it's a giving of oneself over. Now, the difference is, back in chapter 6, it talks about yielding our members or yielding portions of our life over to sin or parts of our life over to righteousness. But here, there are no members involved. Here, it talks about the body. The entire body. And it is reminiscent of the Old Testament sacrifices when an an entire um, lamb or goat or something, the entire body of that animal would be received as a sacrifice and slain. But here in this passage, it's talking about human bodies, our bodies, and And the the concept here then is one of giving up our whole self, everything that we are. We're not holding anything back, in other words. So we're supposed to present then our bodies, our whole entire bodies. We have this word here then, 
it's that we're presenting our bodies as a sacrifice. Now, this word is not foreign to you or me, nor would it be foreign to the readers uh, of this letter to the Romans. Immediately, when we think of sacrifice, or when they thought of sacrifice, two main things would come to mind, would they not? One we've already mentioned, those Old Testament sacrifices. Such an integral part of the, the, the devotion that God expected of His people back then. And then, of course, the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That whole giving of Himself over for the benefit of you and me. That's what obviously comes to mind. But there is a difference between those sacrifices that we just talked about and the sacrifice that Paul is talking about right here. You see, all of those animals that were were sacrificed on the altars day after day after day, all of them were slain. They were killed. Jesus, when He offered Himself as a sacrifice, He literally died on that cross and was buried. His pulse stopped. And thanks be to God, He did not stay in the grave. He rose again. But it wasn't until He rose again that He was alive once again. Jesus died, was clinically dead. No, Paul is not asking us to offer up our bodies as a sacrifice to be killed. What does it say there? This is a sacrifice that is living. A living sacrifice is what Paul is asking of us. That's kind of a strange concept. When you have in your mind sacrifice means death, and that's what it means over and over again, and perhaps that's exactly what the readers of Romans thought. It's like, wow, this is a different concept. And it is a different concept. A sacrifice that isn't slain, one that keeps living, what does that look like? So we see then that the quality of our response, therefore, the response, our response to God's glorious plan and His mercy is a presentation of our bodies as a sacrifice that is alive. I've been meditating and studying and thinking about this concept for, for more than months, it seems like. This concept of being a living sacrifice. And as you think about that, so many things may come to mind. But one of the things that obviously has to come to mind, especially on this day, is the type of sacrifice that mothers give on a regular basis, every day, for their children. I think of my own mother, who many of you know, and she half-jokingly says that after I was born, her health went south. I am the reason for, I am her first child, I am the reason that she has all the health problems that she has today. And she, she jokingly says it, but... And, I mean, I can't argue with it either because she was in pretty good health before I was born and, and it's been a lot of struggle physically for her ever since then. And I see that in my, in my own mom, that she gave up her body. And think about it, in mothers in general, I mean, from the very beginning, I've watched my own wife give her body up to grow a child, to grow another human being. That's a bodily sacrifice. And then after the children are born, and they, grow, and, and they, they need to be fed more than once a day, 
many times more than once a day. It's incredible how needy these little itty-bitty people are. And yet the mothers are there, ready. It's in, the, other, the other thing that's incredible to me is how I can have, this is really bad, I can have a perfect night's sleep when a newborn is, is, is born. And my wife will tell me, Miranda will tell me the next day, oh, this was a, it was a terrible night. He woke up here and here and here and here and, and it was just this bottomless pit that didn't stop wanting something to eat and to be changed and, and then was crying for no reason. And I got no sleep last night. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't help at all. She gives up her sleep. The mother gives up her body, gives up her sleep. And then they, these little people who all they can say is wah and meh, they eventually they grow up and they're able to say things. My, my littlest one, Ezra, is now just beginning to pick up on words and, and ask for things. And let me tell you, he's got no problem asking. No problem asking whatsoever. And many of you mothers and, and parents in general can, can relate to this. The more kids you have, the more requests there are. They just, they never stop. And, and I'll, be, I'll be working at the computer or, or doing something, and I'll hear in the background, it, it, all three of them want something at the same time. And it, it stands to reason, why did, we, why did we do this fourth child thing? I don't know. I don't know. It's just one more to eventually ask for things. And who do they go to? They really don't come to dad to ask things. Mommy's, mommy's all constantly deflecting. Go ask your father. Go ask him. He's a perfectly legitimate human being that can provide for your needs. And yet, they, they just want to go to their mother. And I wonder if it isn't because they know with their mother she's going to do it for them, whatever it is. Maybe not on the timetable that they want, but if, as a kid, if I have a need, I'm going to my mom before my dad. Now, some, some children have a leniency to their fathers, but I don't know, in, in my experience, all of my siblings, my kids, it's obvious, they go to their mom. And I think it's because moms are so utterly dependable to come through. So no wonder they keep going to their mother. Because any time she's needed, she's been there. And she's willing to go the extra mile to meet a child's need. because she sacrificed in the past and she's going to sacrifice in the future. To this day, to this day, it, it almost doesn't matter what I ask my mom. She's there, boom, in a heartbeat. She's there to help. Doesn't matter what she has on her plate, I can wait. As she would say, her baby needs me. My baby needs me, I'm going to I'm going, to, I'm going to help him. Mothers are an incredible example of what it means to be a living sacrifice. Living primarily, not for the benefit of self, but for the benefit of someone else. And in many cases, multiple someone else's. The other thought that I have been meditating on when it, when it comes to this idea of what it means to be a living sacrifice, a sacrifice that is alive, really, the implications of this phrase, <clears throat> they, they have some unpopular ramifications. This term... Sacrifice, it really isn't a popular idea 
when it comes to how we are supposed to respond to God's glorious plan and His mercy. When your whole life, and that's, that's what we're asking, that's what God is asking for us. He's asking for our whole life to be a sacrifice. When, when we think of that, when our whole life is devoted as a sacrifice to something or someone else, to me there is only one word that really encompasses that idea. And it is tremendously unpopular. You ready for what it is? The best word that I can see that encompasses that idea is slave. Ooh, slave. That's bad. Slavery. That, that you know, ripped America apart and, and it has very negative connotations with it. <clears throat> slave. I mean, as a slave, you have no rights. You, you have nothing. All you're doing is living for the benefit of your master. That's no fun. There's no freedom in that. You know, in the teen Sunday school class, we're, we're going through the beginning of Exodus right now. And we're in that time period when the entire Hebrew race is enslaved by the Egyptians. And they're ruling over them. And they are being treated cruelly, I mean terribly. They're they're being beaten, they're being whipped, they're being assaulted. And if that wasn't enough, they, the paranoid rulers of that day decide, well, your children really don't, your, your male children don't have any right to be alive, so we're just going to throw them into the river. You know, when we think of slavery, that's the type of thing that we think. We think of cruel treatment. We think of all these terrible Way, reasons why slavery is bad. There's no freedom. There's nothing good in slavery. And yet, we all stand aghast at the thought that many of the writers of the New Testament, what do they call themselves? Romans chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. The word there is typically translated servant, but as, as many of you already know, that, that word is the word doulos, and it means to be a bond servant, a slave. This isn't being a butler for somebody. This isn't being the maid for somebody where you're paid. No, this is... Slavery. Paul says it again in Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timotheus, the slaves of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Titus 1.1. 1, 1, 1. Paul says again, Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. But Paul isn't it. James Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Peter, 2 Peter 1, 1, Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Jude, Jude, chapter 1, verse 1, Jude, the slave of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. They have no qualms about freely admitting who they are to Jesus Christ. It's how they began all of those letters to those people. Can you imagine? <laughs> you walk up to somebody, say, hey, how are you? Good. All right. Hi, I'm Enrique Lopez, slave of my master, Jesus Christ. How are you doing today? And yet, this is how they chose to introduce themselves on multiple occasions to their readers.
first and foremost, they saw themselves as slaves. And I can think of no better term than that to give us the idea of what a living sacrifice truly is. You know, we would probably never go up to somebody or even write to somebody and say, Hi, my name's Enrique Lopez. I'm a slave of my master Jesus Christ. But let's ask a serious question. What if we primarily saw ourselves as slaves? Before our occupation before whatever roles we have in the home, before, before all of that, what if, before, before any tasks that we have, before whatever it is that we happen to be very good at, what if all we really eval valued about ourselves was being a slave for our Master Jesus? What if, to us, life was just really about being a living sacrifice? Yes, we have responsibilities. Yes, we have roles. Yes, we may have titles. But that's just surface. And when you get down to the real meat of who we are, we just consider ourselves as slaves. That's how we identify ourselves. It's so easy, and I, I see this in my own life, it's so easy to identify ourselves by what we predominantly do and what comes naturally to us and what we're good at. I gotta say, uh, it's been interesting after, after um, I guess, a little over a year now of starting up my own business and side work and such and, and sensing the immediate respect that I get from other people when I tell them that that's something that I have done and, do, and are doing. And you know what the temptation is for me? It's very easy very easy to find my identity in the fact that I run my own side business. And it's very easy to become proud about it, which would be ridiculous because it's God who has given me the ability to do it. He, he put it all together. He made it work out as I look back how, over how it happened. And yet, can I just be honest with you, the temptation is there especially when meeting someone new, and especially when they inquire about the things that I'm involved with and that I do, and it comes up, and I see the respect in their eyes, and I just have to take a step back and say, whoa, that, that's not all of me. Enrique, that's not what you're all about. You can't just be about that. Does it take my time? Do I have to be devoted to it to make it work right? Yes, but I cannot fall into the trap that, that that's where I really find the most value about myself. What about you? What are you tempted to identify yourself as? As I look around this room and, and I think of the members in our church body, I know that there has to be a variety of temptations in that regard. Whether it's being a business owner, which I know there are several here, whether it's that role that you have in the home, where you, wherever it is that you really get fulfillment, that is probably where you are tempted to identify yourself. That's probably where you are tempted to value the most. How are we identifying ourselves? 
So is it possible? Is it possible to have an identity crisis as a Christian? Yes. And it takes place when we have wrongly identified ourselves. Because when one of those aspects of our lives gets stripped from us that we hold dear, what's left? What's left? So, Enrique, you, you are asking us to consider the fact that the most valuable thing about us is being a slave? Yes, I am. How is that possible? How? How can that be the most valuable thing? How could anyone view themselves primarily as a slave? I mean, slaves are treated poorly. Well, let's back up a second. Because the experience of a slave, get this now, the experience of a slave is completely dependent upon the master that they are serving. What does Christ say about following him? Turn to, keep your finger in Romans, turn to Matthew 11, chapter 11, verse 29. How could anyone see themselves as a slave primarily over all the statuses, over all the roles, over all the titles? How could they primarily see themselves just as a slave? Being a slave is bad. Well, it all depends on the type of master that you have. And can I just say that we have the best master that there is. Jesus says in verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the master-slave relationship between us and Jesus is far different from that of a typically earthly slave-master relationship. In fact, all the things that Jesus says in those two verses, all the things that he promises when following him, are pretty much exactly the opposite of what you could expect if you are a slave to a cruel master. He says that he is meek and lowly in heart. A cruel master is proud and arrogant and in your face and yelling and screaming and maybe even physically abusing you and beating you. Not with Jesus. He says here that you will find rest in your souls. When you're a slave to a cruel master, there is no rest. There is no peace in your souls. There's only turmoil and fear. What's he going to do next? What's going to happen next? How am I going to upset him this time? Not with Jesus. With Jesus, there is rest. There is peace. There's fulfillment in your souls. He says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, when you have a cruel master, your yoke is hard and the burden is heavy, sometimes more than you can bear. So I ask this question. If Jesus is not our master and we don't primarily see ourselves as slaves of our master Jesus Christ, then who is our master? And it can really only be summed up in a few options. Me, myself, and I. Or... And we even see in Romans 6, sin 
can be our master. And for someone who is very far gone and most likely not even saved, the devil is his master. Which master do you want? Because those three other masters, they're cruel. I mean, most of us, if we're honest, I know myself, my natural inclination is I could figure out my life pretty good by myself. That's the natural man. That's the sinful nature saying, I can handle this. But boy, if I had complete reins of my life, if I just took control and did whatever it was that I felt like doing, I'd be a wreck. My leadership would ruin me. Your leadership would ruin you. We cannot be our own masters. We self-destruct when we are our own masters. If sin is our master, oh, well, that's a destructive path to be on. The wages of sin is death. And if it's not eternal death, then there are physical earthly consequences from our sin. That's a cruel master. We don't want that to be our master. And if the devil is our master, well, he hates you. He hates you. He has nothing good planned for you. He wants to see you self-destruct. He wants to see your life blown to smithereens. Certainly, you wouldn't want to choose him as your master. And yet, by our daily actions and by what we choose to do, who are we identifying as our master? And maybe it means we're making nonsensical decisions. Why would I want to serve one of these cruel masters when I have Jesus who wants to be my Lord and Master? And His burden is light, and His yoke is easy, and He's not cruel. He doesn't spur fear in my heart. No, He's meek and lowly in heart, and in Him I can find peace and rest. Why wouldn't I choose Him to be my master? Why wouldn't I identify myself as His slave? It just makes sense, doesn't it? What doesn't make sense is when we choose to serve some other master. This living sacrifice, then, that is our lives, let's be real specific about this. It's, it is not done or motivated by a desire to become right or more right with God. Many, many would read this text and see, oh, especially considering verse 2, which we're not getting to today because I really wanted to hone in on this particular aspect of, of Paul's teaching. But when taking this together, there is a lot of focus on, on the doing and the being right and and you can tend to get the sense that we're doing this on a performance-based, duty-driven, i got to be this sacrifice for God. But let's remember very clearly, this is a response to what God has already done. This is a response to His mercy and His glorious plan that He set forth before the foundation of the world that's what he did. And this, this is how we are supposed to respond according to this text. It is done in a response to his mercy. So then, this is a sacrifice, this living sacrifice, this slave ship, if you will. is a sacrifice of worship and praise. You know, there were sacrifices in the Old Testament that were done to atone for sin. 
that were done to appease God's wrath. There were also those sacrifices that were in celebration of God and what he had done and what he had accomplished. That's the kind of sacrifice, that's the kind of living sacrifice that we're talking about. It is a life given over to God that is one of praise and worship to him. Maybe, maybe you've heard of the concept of, well, every day should be, should be a, uh, a day that's given over to worshiping God. Well, how do I do that? How do I go to work in traffic and then be at work and deal with the drama that's there and then come home from work in traffic and come be home and then deal with the drama that might be there? How do I every day live like I'm worshiping God? That doesn't sound feasible. That doesn't sound like reality. That sounds like pie in the sky. Well, it is feasible when you identify yourself as a slave to Jesus Christ. Because no matter what it is that you're doing, and no matter what aspects of your life you are doing at that particular time, you see yourself primarily not in that role, not in that title, not in that status, but you see yourself as nothing more than His. And that's it. The rest, it's just details. Reality for you and for me is that I am a slave of the most wonderful master ever. And I can handle whatever drama there is, can handle whatever traffic there is, can handle it because I belong to him. And he is a kind master. He's meek and lowly, and his burden is light. So your whole life then, in effect, can be one of worship. And that's probably why some of the translations, and we'll get more into this in just a second, but some of the translations where it says, which is your reasonable service, that word service in some trans legitimate translations translates service worship, which is your reasonable worship. As we continue, I just want to bring you to this thought. We ought to be finding our supreme value, not in our titles, not in our roles, not in our responsibilities, not in what we're good at. We ought to be finding our supreme value in belonging to Jesus, in being that living sacrifice for Him, in being His slave. To some this may seem too extreme. To some, it may seem way too radical. This type of commitment is going too far. But to God, this way of life is simply logical. It's simply the reasonable thing to do. The basis for our response is God's mercy and His glorious plan. The quality of our response is full commitment to Him, identifying ourselves as a slave, and the logic, thoroughly the logic behind our response, it's just reasonable. Or in other words, this response just makes sense. He says there that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, and we could have gotten into some of that there too. There, there's great truth there, but for time's sake, we'll, we'll go over that and say this, this sacrifice is wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which is your logical response. It is your reasonable worship. This, uh, this word that is used there for service, which is also translated worship, it's actually used in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, when it says that 
and especially in the commands, when it talks about worshiping God rather than idols, where it says, Thou shalt not worship them, neither shall you serve them. And this idea of worshiping and serving are linked together very often. Thou shalt not worship them, that's proskuneo in, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and then serve them, that's our word right here. Latruo, same word. So this idea of worship and service, they are linked. And that's why we see here then that this word is translated worship. This is then, to sum that up, this is the logical way this living as a living sacrifice, it is the logical way that you and I display our praise to God. It's by being a living sacrifice. How do you truly identify yourself? What do you see about yourself as most valuable? I leave you with this one thought. We, we need to find our identity and our supreme value in belonging to Jesus. In being that living sacrifice for Him. In being that slave that belongs to Him, to our Master. Find your identity, your supreme value in being in belonging to Jesus, in being that living sacrifice for Him, in being His slave, wherever the road takes you, wherever the path leads you, never, ever forget who you belong to. He is a master worth serving. Far, far better option than any of the other masters you could be tempted to serve. Ask God today. Ask Him. Are you correctly identifying yourself? Or, if you're not, are you running the risk of having a sort of Christian identity crisis? Ask yourself and ask God, are you identifying yourself correctly today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your rich mercies and your glorious plan that was in your mind before the foundation of the world. You've done for us what we could never do for ourselves. You've given us what we don't deserve and withheld from us what we definitely do deserve. And Lord, from your word today, we've seen that you expect us to respond, to not just have a mental assent of these truths, but that it would actually affect not just our daily lives, but our whole lives. Father, would you create in us the clarity of thought to know if we are correctly identifying ourselves? Lord, help us to recognize that there is no better master to serve than the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to turn from those other masters that would seduce us Help us to see the, the sense, the, law, the, the reasonableness of living this way. Help us to see ourselves and identify ourselves primarily as your slave. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.